Welcome to uh, Meeting of the Libertarian Alliance. We meet here every month, different topic every month. Um, this uh, week we have, uh, this month rather, we have uh, Stephen Berry talking on uh, Norman Angel and the grand solution, the grand liberal solution to war. It's, um, it's just over a hundred years since Norman Angel wrote a book called The Great Illusion, which was a bestseller, and um, it still remains the, also the best exposition of the classical liberal or libertarian case against war. So I'm going to uh, review that. Uh, Angel himself uh, enjoyed a tremendous vogue with this book, um, and eventually in the, the early 1930s he won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, but there's a huge irony in his life, and that is, although he was very successful, and I believe his arguments in The Great Illusion are, are sound, um, his uh, analysis of um, the futility of war, uh, he became, in the 1930s, um, almost an advocate of the uh, Churchillian anti-appeasement line. So I, I want to, first of all, uh, cover his arguments uh, against war, and then I'm going to explain how he got to this position where he was in effect a supporter of Winston uh, Spencer Churchill. Um, the, the book is really consisting of a, a criticism of what, he, what he sees as a, num a number of illusions. And the first big one is that um, uh, Economic advantage rests somehow on military power. Uh, you, you might hear some people say the US is the most powerful military and therefore implied the economic power in the world. Um, but Angel against this argued that uh, wealth in the economically advanced world is founded on credit and commercial contract. And these are the results of economic interdependence brought about by the increasing division of labor and mo modern communications. He said if credit and commercial uh, contracts are tampered with, then there's a, a, a knock-on effect and there's a damage to everybody, um, including the victors. And his other argument, his other big general argument, was that uh, you don't also gain a moral or spiritual advantage through war. Um, although this is argued by some people, and um, the actual moral and spiritual movements go on between citizens across states. So you might, for instance, have uh, today, you might have something like the Green Movement, which of course is uh, influential across many different countries, whatever you, whatever you think of it. Um, but these, these two big ideas which he had are actually very, uh, not really accept accepted, I would say. Um, for instance, if we looked at the uh, war in Iraq, um, you would often hear the uh, left say that uh, the uh, US invaded Iraq to gain access to the oil, which would therefore, uh, presumably, increase its economic power. So, you know, that is something which uh, Angel thought would be wrong. We'll come to, come to why in a minute. And then that you could look at the argument of the right, which was that we'll invade Iraq to bring democracy and the rule of law to Iraq. And uh, they also thought they could do that by using um, uh, the method of war. Uh, Angel in this book, The Great Illusion, also he, he questioned things like th th that you add ter when you add territory to your uh, dominions that you also make yourself wealthier uh, and he had a strong argument I remember this book was written in 1908 so this was written at the time of the um, rivalry between European powers um, and particularly between Germany and uh, Britain he said that uh, he dealt with such arguments as could, the, could Germany take British trade and colonies by military force? Um, and did a mo does a modern nation need to expand its physically, physical boundaries in order to 
provide for an exp expanding population. Um, so I'll look at some of these in a little bit more detail. Um, one thing he points out is that smaller nations which don't have big uh, military powers, countries such as Switzerland, Holland, Belgium, Denmark, and Sweden, is that their uh, prosperity doesn't uh, differ dramatically from that of countries like Germany, France, and the UK. I mean, that was true 100 years ago. I don't think it's any different now. And you could have uh, one of the major military powers of the um, 20th century, the USSR, uh, which was uh, very, rather poor economically. Um, he also said that, uh, could the Germans take British trade as a result of a victorious war? Well, um, if the Germans decided to take the trade of the uh, British by war, they would also be damaging one of the, the British economy, which is one of the uh, main German markets. And this is, uh, this is something that is uh, often missed. In fact, paradoxically, the Germans did st start to make inroads into British markets in the 1950s and 60s, but this was after a defeat of the Second World War. And ditto with the uh, Japanese and the um, uh, American markets. They'd been defeated after 1945, but they made considerable inroads into um, American markets. And, and the military defeat didn't seem to do anything to prevent this. Um, Uh, Angel also put, I mean, in the same line, he also, Angel points out that if Germany conquered Holland, and this, we, again, we're talking about before the uh, First World War, uh, the German merchants would still have to meet the competition of the Dutch. Uh, in fact, the competition might be more intense because the Dutch would then, the Dutch merchants would then not have to face any German customs duties. Um, and, yeah. The only, the only really feasible uh, policy in the modern world uh, is for the conqueror to leave the wealth of the territory which is, which is conquered in the possession of the occupants. Um, uh, he points out that in 1908 Canada was part of the British Empire, uh, but a British merchant could be driven from the Canadian market by a US or Swiss merchant. Um, and he said that the Dutch citizen whose government possesses no considerable military power is just as well off as the British citizen and considerably better off than his Russian counterpart. Um, he also points out that uh, you can have a rough and ready um, guide to the relative wealth of a, a nation by how its government's debt is, re is regarded. And he pointed out that, and, and again, we're, lo we're looking 100 years ago, um, that um, the debt of countries such as Holland and Norway considerably outperforms that of Germany and Russia. And of course, again, it's the same uh, in, um, at this time, you know, the debt of Switzerland is probably one of the safest in the world um, at the moment. And the Swiss, of course, have uh, very little military power. Uh, it did have to face one criticism of this uh, point of view. And that was that uh, when Alsace was annexed by the Germans in uh, 1871, uh, it was pointed out the inhabitants of Alsace then paid their taxes to Germany rather than to France. And someone wrote in, uh, in the Daily Mail at the time, uh, said that uh, a revenue of 8 million to, uh, to the state, accrued to the German state rather than to the French state. And, uh, but of course, what, what is missing, the person who wrote that, is that you not only uh, get the taxation, but if a, if a citizen of Alsace becomes a member of the German state, he also gets uh, the benefits. Because uh, once, uh, once the German government has paid its own uh, political class and it's all our army of lackeys, then it, the, the money is handed back in, to the citizens in, in the form uh, which it's um, hoped will uh, 
produce gratitude uh, in the citizens. And um, so, you know, it's a two-way process. And of course, Angel then goes on to point out, he said, well, look, if, uh, if the Germans really did gain from uh, ex extra possibilities of taxation of Alsace and Lorraine, what about the British? And they remember, this is uh, 1908. He said, they've got a huge empire all around the world. They've got uh, goodness knows how many hundreds of millions of uh, citizens. And uh, he says, why on earth is the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, this is 1908, at his wit's end to get a few uh, million quid for the social services? Uh, you know, in other words, it's not so simple as to say, well, we've got all these people in our empire, let's just tax them. Uh, because uh, some of them don't want to be taxed, and also the money that also goes back to the people when they have been taxed. Um, so that that is the, that is the main argument of the book, which is that adding territory doesn't necessarily increase uh, economic uh, wealth. He dealt with the um, uh, conquest and the population question, which was much more uh, popular at the. Uh, at the time as an argument. And of course, um, it was hugely inf influential after the First World War, uh, particularly with the National Socialists, who believed that um, they needed, uh, and, and other countries as well, need, that they needed land in order for a particular nation to um, be successful. And it influenced uh, political policies in the, in the 20s and 30s in uh, Germany and, of course, Japan as well. And um, Angel simply points out that uh, even if the, Ger if the Germany conquered uh, Canada, could the Germans get the wheat for nothing, he said? Uh, would not the Germans have to pay for it just as they do now? Would, it, would conquest make economically any difference? And um, in the same way, when the US conquered uh, Iraq in 2003, didn't the American consumers still not have to pay for oil on the world market? Um, uh, in fact, I would say that history of the world economy since 1945 shows that uh, both Germany and Japan could flourish without this uh, Lebensraum, as it was called in Germany, that you don't need to add extra territory to your uh, country in order to be able to feed the people and to um, and for, for your people to prosper. Uh, so he thought that was another fallacy. A further uh, point he made was, um, and I won't dwell too much on this one, but it, it was what he called the indemnity futility. And um, one of the uh, points he said was that uh, people thought, oh, well, you defeat a country, you can make it pay a huge indemnity to uh, you, and in that way you will gain uh, through the war. But he, he uh, Angel said that um, the victor would be uh, rather unlikely to wish to see his, uh, his uh, market swamped by in the enormous quantities of goods produced by a defeated enemy, because a defeated enemy would only be able to pay a big indemnity by producing goods to sell to that country to earn the money to pay the indemnity. And um, Angel thought that um, his quote was, the difficulty in the case of a large indemnity is not so much the payment by the vanquished as the receiving by the victor. He, he, he got quite a lot of crit criticism for this. Um, and uh, uh, I think the results after World War I, when there was a huge indemnity merry-go-round, and uh, it ended up with all the debts being written off pretty well around about 1930 when it was decided nobody could pay anymore. Uh, I think that uh, showed that Angel was pretty well right on that, that... Um, uh, it isn't, it isn't so easy to uh, get the indemnity paid. And the, the main thing is to ensure that markets are smooth and functioning 
And you, then you, uh, that's the way that nations are getting uh, wealthier, not through um, the use of physical coercion. Um, a couple of other arguments were, uh, don't some capitalists profit from the war? You know, this is, this is one of the arguments that, that some people have benefited from the war. Don't certain cap cap capitalists profit from the war, therefore we'll, we'll have wars. And the other one is just a general argument, isn't, uh, isn't war inherent in the capitalist system? Well, uh, Angel's argument against this was, well, yes, uh, some capitalists do pro profit from the war, uh, although most don't. And uh, he said, but certainly some chemists or drug companies will profit from a, a, a smallpox epidemic or any, any other uh, medical uh, disaster. But he says, why are um, smallpox uh, profiteers powerless and war profiteers powerful? Uh, and he just makes the point that it's, it's extremely difficult to persuade the public that there are any benefits from smallpox or any other uh, major disease, uh, whereas you, somehow you seem to be able to persuade the public that um, it's worthwhile having a war. Uh, those who profit from the war are powerful because they can use the argument that a war is advantageous, right or glorious. Uh, and um, the answer to the war profiteer is to create in the mind of the general public the same feeling about war which is now which it now has about smallpox, um, and as I pointed out, the vast majority of capitalists will lose financially during a war, uh, although they might support the war because they've fallen to the same fallacious ideas that have entranced all the other people who supported the war. Um, then there's this sort of general uh, argument: that there's something inherent in capitalism that. Uh, causes war. Well, what Angel says there, he, he uses the example of uh, North America and he, he says that um, if the, um, the 13 colonies of North America had failed in their efforts of federation and there'd been a, a separation of these colonies and, you, and it had followed more the um, South American route and you, you got different countries from the uh, colonies of Spain. And he, he said, well, imagine North America, you had a French speaking one, say in Louisiana, a Spanish speaking one on the West Coast, a Dutch one in the Hudson Valley and an English colony in New England. He said he thought all these countries would have their, all these, um, sorry, colonies would have their uh, own army, currency, tariffs, rights to rivers and lake. And he said, we can be pretty sure that there'd been war between uh, these, uh, these countries. He said, just as there was war between Chile and, and Peru. Um, and amusingly he says, if you had independent North American states, then you would get the same feeling that prevails between independent European states, such as France and Germany. He said, you get historical grievances, bitter national feuds, and lying school history books, as he puts it. Um, and then he, he says, well, what, what would we put, what would we put the disputes between independent US states down to? He said, would it be capitalism? But it couldn't be capitalism because capitalism would exist in all these individual states. And um, Angel's argument is the cause of war uh, in the US in those circumstances would be anarchic nationalism, just as the cause of uh, war in Europe in the 20th century was anarchic nationalism. Um, uh, he says capitalism in its economic theory is just as in internationalist as socialism, uh, and in practice rather more so. He says, it's the workers who are anti-immigrant, the capitalists who employ the foreign workers. And uh, Angel was writing in 1908, and he noted that the impetus for the anti-alien, anti-Negro, anti-Chinese, and anti-Japanese legislation in the US, Canada, and Australia came from the workers who were worried about their jobs, and anyway, didn't care much for these um, foreign interlopers. Um, 
Another argument that he deals with uh, in the book is the, the argument that there's something, something about um, uh, human beings that renders them, uh, by the nature, warlike. He says, uh, man is a fighting animal. This is, he's putting it the straw man. Man is a fighting animal, pugnacious, quarrelsome, irrational, ready to fight for a sign, rarely guided by reason. And he just says about this, well, yes, there's something in this, obviously. Uh, we, you know, we need uh, peace conferences, treaties, constitutions, all the rest of it. He said, but that's th all this is no argument for um, uh, not taking precautions. He, he, said, he said, just because uh, disease, disease may be inevitable, it's not any argument not to take all sorts of precautions against it. Um, similarly, you know, you may, there may always be crime, undetected murders, but this is uh, not an argument for abolishing the uh, police force. So uh, there may well be some, some violence, some war, but uh, it's important that you uh, point out that uh, you, sh you should uh, make all efforts to um, make war less likely. Uh, and and it's, a fairly, it's, it's a fairly simple point, I think, then. And um, that pretty well actually covers um, his main arguments against the war. Uh, he wasn't a pacifist, by the way. He, uh, he said, um, I'll quote from him here, he said, are we immediately to cease preparation for war since our defeat cannot advantage our enemy, nor do us in the long run much harm. He said that no such conclusions result from a study of the considerations elaborated here. It is evident that so long as the misconception we are dealing with is all but universal in Europe, so long as the nations believe that in some way the military and political subjugation of others will bring with it a tangible material advantage to the conqueror, we all do in fact stand in danger from such aggression. So of course he, he, he realized that as long as the People held mistaken ideas. You were in danger, and that is uh, that is correct, I believe. Um, his argument really is that it, it's uh, it is a great illusion. It, 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 it's a myth, and um, he said there's a, there's a multi multitude of uh, things which our ancestors thought were justified uh, at the time: human sacrifices, slavery, dictatorship judicial torture and dueling, and we, uh, on the whole, now think they're wrong or just plain silly. So Angel just wanted to put war in the same category as these institutions, um, which are, he believes long since served any useful purpose. Um, and that, was, that, that is the, those are the main arguments of the great illusion. So I'll just come on very briefly to, um, the second part, which is really how how did he, having analysed war as uh, what he thought was a, a futile exercise, what was his solution to stopping it? And um, this this led got him into a, what I think was a paradoxical position, but and I'll explain that. And um, you see, he thought that the solution to war, and I'll quote him here, was to make of power in the international field what it is within the nation an instrument whereby the settlement of disputes by the sh sheer brute force of one of the parties is made impossible by common and collective resistance to aggression, by common defense of the one supreme law that no nation should use war to enforce its view of its rights. And uh, in the 1930s, uh, the adherence to this principle meant for Angel supporting uh, the League of Nations and he would have supported the League of Nations against uh, Japan in the case of uh, Manchuria and China and against Italy over Abyssinia, and then against uh, Germany in the case of the Sudetenland. And so he ended, he ended up in the 1930s supporting the anti-appeasement line, um, which is identified with uh, Churchill. Um, 
And um, is, is this what the classical liberal case of against war leads to? Uh, well, uh, I don't think so, actually, and uh, I'll explain why. Um, he, he says that, uh, at one point he says in his book, he says, uh, we could have said in 1935, we shall defend the covenant, the covenant being uh, the covenant of the League of Nations, and in this case he meant uh, defending Abyssinia, precisely as we would defend Kenya. Well, you have to remember that in 1935, Kenya was a British colony. And he said, uh, to say that, it wouldn't, would, would not have meant bombs on London any more than our known intention to defend uh, Kenya means bombs on London. Um, and he seems to be saying here that British foreign policy should have been geared to preserving the um, principle that force must not rule in the post-Versailles world, that post the Treaty of Versailles. And uh, this meant that the traditional view of uh, foreign policy, which is preserving the um, national economic security of a particular country would uh, would have to take a back seat. Um, wh and it, what it particularly meant in the post uh, uh, the interwar years, the, po the post Versailles period, was that uh, Britain, preferably in conjunction with France, would be policing the world in the same way that the neocons of uh, uh, said in America after 1989 collapse of the Soviet uh, system it, that the USA should uh, defend the world. Um, and there are obvious problems w with this. And uh, the, there was the aspiring imperial powers like Italy and Japan thought that the uh, sudden opposition of the world's premier Im imperial power to the use of force was a little curious. Uh, the Japanese uh, uh, leader of the delegation at Geneva, a fellow called Yasuki Matsuoka, uh, he commented on this new attitude. He says, the Western players, uh, power, sorry, taught the Japanese the game of poker, but after acquiring most of the chips, they pronounced the game immoral and took up contract bridge. And then a French woman, evidently, at the time of the... Um, Abyssinian crisis, she told Churchill, she said, uh, he said, the thing, what Italy was doing in Ethiopia is what uh, Britain had practiced for centuries. And Churchill replied, he says, ah, but you see, all that belongs to the unregenerate past is locked away in the limbo of the old wicked days. The world progresses. Um, uh, so lots of people took this, with a, obviously, with a whole warehouse full of salt. Uh, the, the, the new policy. Um, but there's no other way, I think, that Angel saw of um, enforcing the uh, doctrine that force shouldn't be used after 1919. And um, there was the other point against it, of course, is that um, Britain really wasn't uh, uh, powerful enough to do it in any case, however unrealistic uh, in other ways it was. It's in the interwar years, the UK had a population of about 45 million and France about the same. But against that, you've got Germany with a population of 70 million, Japan 70 million, Italy 45 million, and the USR almost 200 million. So were Britain and France really in a position to police the world and ensure that both the Covenant and the League of Nations, uh, and implicitly their own empires, of course, were preserved? Um, in fact, I think it had the opposite effect, and that is that uh, by uh, trying to do this, and so, uh, the Japanese were annoyed. Uh, the, Brit the British refused to re uh, renew the Japanese alliance in the uh, early 1920s, and then in the 1930s they antagonized the Italians. And of course, that put the British Empire in jeopardy. Now, I'm, not, I'm not a great supporter of the British Empire, but they weren't, the British weren't about to get rid of it in the 1920s and 30s. And um, to pursue policies which put it in uh, some danger and meant that when you fought uh, a war, you would be in um, a much worse position than you were prior to the First World War, 
didn't look sensible. In fact, were positively dangerous. And you might say they encouraged war because they encouraged um, attacks from other countries, which saw you as when they saw you as being um, weaker than you uh, previously were. The um, the big question, of course, in the 1930s was what what are we, what are we going to do about um, Germany? And uh, Angel was quite uh, was fully aware of Hitler's uh, grand plan, and um, he discussed it at some length. I won't go into the full because uh, he'd read Mein Kampf, so he, he discussed it at some length, and I won't go into the uh, all the details. And um, but he knew that. Uh, uh, Hitler wanted to annex land in the east, Lebensraum, as he called it, which meant essentially where the present Ukraine is. And um, Hitler's, uh, sorry, uh, Angel uh, thought that um, he continually stressed that Britain should ally with the USSR to combat uh, German policy. Uh, but of course, this was an anathema to uh, many Eastern Europeans who feared the Russians more than the Germans. Um, and there was very little, again, this is a practical matter, there's very little that the British could do in Eastern uh, Europe to affect matters. Um, uh, and I, I, I think, and I've uh, argued this before, that the sensible policy was to uh, just say, w w uh, what um, previous British politicians in the 18th and 19th century said, well, we can't really inf influence Eastern Europe. Uh, this, is, this is an area where uh, whatever Germany or Russia want, uh, other countries will have to fall in with. And that was the policy, should have been the policy uh, of the interwar period. You know, if, if there was going to be a clash between Germany and the Soviet Union, so what wasn't something you welcomed, but you know it was something which was going to happen. It's a bit like looking at the um, position of uh, China and uh, the Soviet Union in the 1960s from the American point of view. You know, uh, why should they? You know, why should they try to prevent this? Why should they get involved? You know, this was this was something uh, which was outside their uh, control, really. And that that is that was the position with, I believe, with the. Um, Soviet Union in Germany. Um, so, I mean, that, that's the basic uh, point. Um, the angel wanted to, if you like, run the world on a uh, no-force basis. But in order to do that, you have to have a country powerful enough to do it. And um, the Americans can't do it now as they've shown uh, quite clearly in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, they're, on, they're only uh, coming up against minor uh, powers. So how on earth uh, Angel thought that the, um, the British could do it in the 1920s and 1930s is a, uh, a bit curious to me. And uh, the sensible policies for libertarian costs is, is trade, free trade, uh, so that different countries um, have economic interest in uh, being peaceful with each other, and uh, event, and that will be a it won't necessarily always prevent war, but that will be a, a buffer or something in people's minds which will um, at least be a force for peace. Um, and I think that is what libertarians should argue, and not for this, uh, the angel position of uh, running the uh, international relations, either through the League of Nations, as he did, or through the United Nations now. <coughs> I think I'll finish there. You can yeah. criticize Thank me. Thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> Do you have any questions or criticisms? David? Hi, Stephen. Uh, you know, what it was that prompted Robert Angel to write that book in 1908, given the fact that uh, Europe had been at peace for decades, it, 
it, it seems a slightly surprising time, um, unless he really had a great deal of foresight as to what was all. No, there'd been several crises uh, uh, in, in the period between uh, uh, the 1890s and uh, 1914. Uh, uh, I mean, there's one at Fashoda, um, there's one at Agadir, and there are other ones as well, where uh, the, the major powers had um, almost come to uh, go, lead to, uh, almost come to blows. And um, he thought he w war was in pretty well inevitable. In 1908? Uh, yeah, or earlier. He, at the time, actually, about 1900, he, he got a job as um, editor of the uh, Paris edition of the Daily Mail. Rother um, uh decided to do a Paris edition, European edition of the Daily Mail, and he got the job of being editor there. And um, he said that... He said that um, he could see war was coming, and he, he, he didn't know quite what to do, whether just to have a good time uh, before, before the balloon went up, or write this book in an attempt to try and stop it, you know. And um, uh, so he wrote the book, and he, he, he spoke foreign, foreign languages, I think he spoke French and, and German, so he went around sell, uh, lecturing, and was very, was very popular, the book had huge sales, uh, but we still had the war in 1914. Any other criticisms or comments or questions? Bob? Uh, over the past, well, my lifetime, certainly the last six years, I've been examining the, um, the way in which we view things, the uh, uh, terms, the categories, the, uh, the mind sets in which we uh, analyze and think of things. Uh, national governments, our economy, things of that kind, our growth, our trade deficit, things of that kind, uh, our government, um, our policies, how these may help our population, the British or the French or the German or whatever. And of course, being more schooled in Adam Smith from there on, uh, I see that uh, we gain, uh, we help each other when we work. Not when we pay our taxes necessarily, not when we uh, make laws or obey laws, but when we work in a peaceful way to make things other people want and are prepared to pay for. And it, in some ways it's as simple as that. We shouldn't look to see how to stop wars between nations. We should more think about what, what was his nation doing? Nation is cuisine or, or, or a language, possibly, or folk music or something. But there should be no more than that. There are just populations all around the world. There's a world population. There's a world population of producers and, if you must have it, those who prey upon producers, perhaps, and they're called governments. Um, so see, in more of that, in that, more of that line. So, so the, the peace comes of having no particular enemies, apart from thieves. <coughs> but of course, if it's on a whole, if it's on a national level and called taxation, it, it's moral and admirable and uh, progressive and the rest of it. And, and our job is to say no, uh, even if we're ignored, pretty much. So um, it's almost a way of saying, this is all marvellous talk, of course, but in a sense, uh, Angel is taking too much for granted. He should, he should seek to undermine rather than advise national governments or national populations. You know, don't see yourself as national. Don't you? I have taken. I have now reached the point where I don't like to talk about economies, like this, that, that economy, and that economy, and that economy, and that. No, no, no. There are producers, and there are means of transport, and there is a money, and there can be one money for the world, free movement of goods and services, or people who provide services. <coughs> What's the the economies doing? There would be no economies. There would be people, free people. But uh, that's, that's a way of, un in a sense, undermining it, or seeing an alternative to it. I mean, Angel was only dealing with the world as uh, he oh. saw it in 1908, when he wrote the first edition. And he made many um, books, of course. <laughs> uh, and he does point out that, um, you know, many of the uh, 
ideological movements, moral movements as he called, moral and spiritual movements as he calls them, they cross boundaries and there will be nothing in his view to uh, prevent something like you, a sort of uh, anti-nationalist or uh, popular movement. Um, but I mean, nation states do, do have some uh, uh, sport amongst people. I mean, we can't deny that. Oh, oh, they do exist, certainly. But Nigel was an anti-nationalist, I'd say. Certainly. And he, he, he endorsed most of what you said. Yes? Thank you. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm casting my mind back to things I heard when I was younger, which was the only place I could have been before. And that was that surplus population uh, political furore at home, uh, sheltering yourself from your bad domestic deeds by casting uh, blame on others, uh, was one reason for wars, but it was a way of people not content. So we have to find an external reason for their not being content. We have to worry about how we'll pay for things which we can't afford, but if we have a war, we might gain something, we might get treasures, we might get other people's wealth. Uh, there's all sorts of reason for grabbing other things. The Napoleonic Wars uh, were mm, all to do with heirlooms and people uh, gathering uh, wealth for themselves or for the country. Well, Yes, I, I mean, Angel doesn't deny that um, things like national glory and uh, national pride exist, and, and, and you know people do get satisfaction from um, from them. And uh, so at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, you add a few more colonies and you paint a bit more of the map red, say, and uh, you get some people happy and uh, and that sort of thing. But he, all he wanted to do was point out that there's no economic gain and that almost inevitably an economic loss from a war. And uh, you can always point that out to, to someone. You know, that at the end of the First World War or the Napoleonic Wars, these huge wars, uh, the standard of living of people in Britain, they've got a bit more of the map painted red, but uh, the standard of living had fallen quite considerably. And yes? Question, so in the book, you discuss the imperialism and the idea of the late 19th century, where colonies were turned more into controlled territories with tariff barriers, and that this would be a motivation for war. For, for Germany, who was reunited in the 1870s and then was confronting, uh, there was this big carve up between France and Britain, and Belgium and others, and Germany also got some pieces. I suspect, in the theory of imperialism, the purpose of this economically. Of course, the whole system doesn't make sense, but once you're in these tariff blocks, uh, it makes sense to enlarge your boundary for your own capitalists, or break through and carve up and, and, and capture territory. Wasn't the British, weren't they imposing uh, tariffs on... Well, no, they didn't, uh, actually. They, they uh, I mean, this is one of the things he talks about. He, he used the example of Canada, I remember, where he pointed out that uh, Swiss or US merchants could drive the British merchants yeah. out of Canada because Brit Britain pursued a policy of pretty well of free trade. Mm -hmm. And in fact, w one of the paradoxes was, I remember, that New South Wales, which was a colony in, in Australia at one time, did put up some tariff barriers. But he put, they put them up against everybody, including the British. So, you know, the British had the control of uh, New South Wales. Um, but they, had, they found that tariffs had been put up against them. But could they be a, a, a customs union, a, a, as we call it now, a tariff union, uh, to, uh, to exclude it? Well, uh, you could do that, yes. I mean, you could do that. Would, would, do, but does the EU benefit from adding more uh, countries to it all the time? I'm not defending the system. I think no, I'm just, I, 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 I'm just, uh, the you know, there are disadvantages, aren't there? Yeah. John? Uh, don't uh, MEPs get um, 
more money than uh, MPs in this country and more expenses, and doesn't a larger uh, country or empire mean that the people, the, 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 the political people, I mean, whoever they might be, whether they be uh, politicians as such or more general political class, they'll have more power, more prestige and more, more health. Oh yes, I mean that's all. That's so, all so, there. So, that's so, all so, part but, of. So well, there's the motivation then. <laughs> well, that, that's one of the motivations. Yes, national glory, uh, generally for for people. But yes, there are obviously people within the uh, system mm. who who um, s you know sit behind an even bigger desk. Yes. And when they look out of the window, they see e e uh, even more uh, people and, under uh, their control. And isn't it a nice thing to be um, a successful uh, thriller writer like John Buchan and end up as a Governor General candidate, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and jobs quite nice. for, for, for their relatives and their friends in, as well. Uh, Pat and then David. Yeah, you, you said he, he says, Foster says that uh, war doesn't produce any economic gain. Norman Angel says that. Norman Angel, yeah. Uh, yes, he, he basically uh, uh, he says overall, for, yeah. I mean, obviously, obviously certain people do gain, but um, overall, uh, war doesn't. Well, did I mean? Didn't it solve the Great Depression? Didn't I mean? Didn't it put loads millions into work, take millions out of unemployment, no. and produce no. an enormous amount of uh, goods, services? Not to mention, I dare, dare I say it, human enjoyment as well. I mean, he, he he's taken from a, from a position that war is bad, it's something we don't want and it's horrible. But, I mean, bear in mind, I mean, even the First World War, I mean, as soon as the masses, whatever country they were in, heard about it, they were all jumping for joy. They couldn't wait to start. Um, they needed conscription to remind them that, uh, you know, <laughs> They, they were on the right track, mind you. They had to be whipped into shape, but, but they wanted they wanted to go there. I remember speaking to some old boys years ago who the uh, you know the red costumes, pensions, and they said to me, um, "You know, the, the, the First World War, everyone says how terrible it was, but then they whisper about what a lovely time they had." He said, "You know, we lived in absolute poverty. You'll never believe the poverty we lived in." And overnight, he said, we had free meals, free cigarettes, free beer, and free women. He said it was unbelievable. No, I said the chances of getting killed were very small. I think it was more, there was more than free troops. So free women weren't allowed to go around. Do you want to answer that? But anyway, it, it well, I'm, I'm going to answer when he finishes. Yeah. Are you finished? It, it pulled the great economies out of the economic mire they were in. Surely. Well, uh, I'll deal with the uh, point. Yes, a lot of people did volunteer for the uh, <coughs> First World War, uh, but then they had to bring in conscription. And um, if it was so popular, you wonder why they did that. And um, you're not allowed, they weren't allowed. I mean, it wasn't a vol voluntary sense that it's a volunteer army. It's like once you've joined, you can then leave. You know, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not that popular that you're allowed to do that. And, um, well, you, you, I, you, you know, I think it, it was a case of uh, uh, they, be they probably believed the uh, propaganda. It'll all be over by Christmas. And um, I think even now, you know, I think wars. Uh, in the uh, something like the Iraq War, or, or the, they're popular for about six or nine months with the public, with the general public, especially if you if, if you see them winning, uh, and then they get uh, the, real, the the penny drops and they realise that this is quite unpleasant, and um, it becomes unpopular, which is what happened in Iraq, of course, and uh, I think that's what happened with World War One. You know, about six months or so. Uh, it wasn't going to be over by Christmas, um, 
and it, it got worse, and then they had to bring in conscription. And of course, one of the things that I always remember about uh, it wasn't this is not just with Britain, but with um, uh, with the Russians. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know if we'd have got to that situation with. Uh, the British, but he said, he, they, they, Lenin said, you know, the troops, they didn't want the war. He said they voted with their feet. They deserted, deserted en masse. And, um, you know, I think that's what happens at the end when they feel that they're fed up with it. Uh, on the, uh, no, they, they, they didn't solve the Great Depression. Um, uh, and it did, you know, a lot of, it produces lots of goods, but these aren't goods that people voluntarily pay for. Uh, you know, you put money in their guns and uh, bullets and things like that. And uh, uh, well, they put money in their pocket. Why can't why can't they get money in their pockets from producing things that people really want? You know, we could do it that way. And when, and when and when when the money is put in the pocket from uh, working in a munitions factory, that is that often results in the. Uh, been a huge debt, which is then paid off at the end of the war. You said, why wouldn't that money be in their pockets anyway? Well, I can tell you why. Because that money would just be sitting in the bank. No one would be spending it. There wouldn't be any need to spend it. When someone's coming at you with a, with a gun, then there's a need to spend it. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with saving money. Yeah. Nothing wrong with saving money at all. Yeah, I mean, you, you consume some of your... Uh, of your income directly, and uh, the whole basis of uh, economic advance is based on savings. And that's an invested. Which is then invested, yeah. Provided it's spent, yes. Sorry, um, it's just yeah. sitting there. Uh, hang on a bit, uh, it's da David, and then, yeah. yeah. Um, to what extent, Steve, do you think that Norma, the Norman Angel's argument uh, that gaining territory and so on and so forth confers no advantage on the victor and indeed is worse. Has any relevance today to uh, to the sorts of wars or war type events that we either have in the 21st century or which are threatened? Well, I, I pointed out that really, you know, you can look at the Iraq war and you saw the arguments which were uh, deployed there and one was uh, that um, well, you get into Iraq, you get the oil. They're going there for the oil, was one argument they had. And the other one is we're bringing democracy to Iraq. So the same, th the same arguments are redeployed. And obviously, uh, it just so happened that it was the left that accepted the arguments on the economic arguments, as they usually do. And uh, it was the right, when I, it was the neocons, as I recollect, who were putting the argument for. Um, uh, draining the swamp, as they called it at the time, to um, you know to, to bring democracy to the Middle East. So you know that was the moral or spiritual line. You know, um, in the First World War, is make the world safe for democracy. But of course, the First World War was absolutely made the world much safer for dictatorship and um, to tell it to totalitarian ideologies. We know that that it, it spawned Bolshevism and National Socialism. And it ended free trade, uh, protectionism. Um, but I mean, the rise and fall of great powers by Paul Kennedy is a, a later follow-up. Have you seen that book, Steve? Rise and fall of great have, powers by I Paul have, Kennedy, yeah. and it more or less goes over that war is the is the thing that makes national debt accumulate and brings makes great powers fall. In fact, and America itself is in trouble now because of the wars it's been in. Of course, uh, one, of, one of the points about the First World War was that um, uh, it, saw, it saw the end, as you mentioned, the great powers. It actually saw the end of um, the uh, old monarchies. And the one power, which uh, was the key, perhaps the keenest to start the, th the whole thing, the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire, wanted to teach the Serbs a lesson, um, collapsed uh, as a result of it, you know. your arguments against a League of Nations and you extended that against the United Nations. I was wondering what would be the libertarian view um, in this kind of interim condition where we have system of nations 
um, and various conflicts in terms of Angel's idea of some kind of a world peace order which, which has some kind of enforcement mechanism. Now, um, you've been arguing against this. I wonder what the argument was, really, uh, in terms of a pragmatism that isn't a, a power, but there is United Nations troops, peacekeeping, and um, Security Council, a whole series of processes. It seems you are criticizing and rejecting this. It seems that Angel was onto something like this. Maybe with the superpower view British, maybe it wasn't quite up to it. You're right, the US isn't quite up to this. But um, so in what you said, I didn't find something particularly compelling or convincing uh, argument to give up on this. It's rather like saying this is not quite working, unrealistic, but then so what are, what are we telling as libertarians to people who, who want to see some kind of recipe of maintaining well, what is a peace, a world peace uh, uh, for uh, uh, free trade? What are the mechanisms? We well, uh, the main mechanism is trade. It's the, the old um, uh, Manchester School, the Cobden mechanism, and that is the more that uh, you trade with other countries uh, and the more they're interdependent, the more that those countries suffer from a war. So you've got an, the immediate economic interest of not going to uh, sure, uh, war. Sorry, now, on the que sorry, on, on your other question, well, there's two separate things here. One is, there's a question of policing the world yeah. as Angel wanted uh, Britain to do after World War I and certain people want the Americans to do after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Soviet system. And I think that's inherently impractical. And if anything, it results in more violence in the sense that you've got the police power going in and um, often just messing things up. And, and then there's the other thing you mentioned, which is uh, UN uh, police uh, or, or um, do you say policing or Peace, whatever? Peacekeeping. peacekeeping, yeah. But I don't have anything against something like that particularly. If, if, if countries volunteer and the, all they're doing is policing a, a border, say, uh, and ensuring that a peace is uh, maintained, something like that, is, is a, you know, they're not going in there to fight particularly. They're just acting as an impartial... And it wouldn't have to be the UN even, it would just be countries who were seen to be impartial. I would have nothing particularly against that, as long as it's done voluntarily. <coughs> Bob? Uh, I think it is the business that we doesn't pay of libertarians not to give advice to nation states, but to advise that there should be no nation states, that there is no advantage to be gained from being a proud uh, subject of a nation state's government. We, we help each other not when we pay our taxes, not when we vote, but when we peacefully engage in commerce, when we respect each other's person and property. That's when we have great use to each other. The politics, on balance, is worse than nothing. Yeah, uh, I would uh, say, that. wouldn't it be good if we could say increase the trade between Britain and Russia or the US and Russia so it's pretty pretty high well there should, um, be, there should be no barriers uh, sure. there should be no barriers but you know if, if they have considerable economic interests in uh, trade with each other then a lot of this uh, ridiculous uh, bellicose chatter would uh, cease you know uh, why, why aren't we so bellicose towards Saudi Arabia, say? We've obviously, you know, we don't particularly, most people in this country don't admire the Saudi Arabian system and uh, whatever, but we've always been on reasonable terms with them, and I have no, absolutely nothing against that, but the reason is, of course, that um, uh, we have uh, considerable uh, uh, defense contracts with them, and I, I know various people have gone out there to work, and um, we purchase oil from them as well, you know, and uh, it's an economic, it's an economic relationship, nothing wrong with them. 
just want to pick up one um, colleague over there uh, in terms of the free movement of people as a as an ambition is of course beautiful. And so the question I have is, um, and I, and I think some to some extent the existence of nations and borders of the collectives want to have borders. There might not be nations, there might be various free associations which are otherwise momentarily is that in, in a world which has so disparate conditions of living, a totally unhampered movement of people might lead to streams of migration, even if you have no wealth of provisions, just trying one's luck. And in, uh, what I worry and one, one, one wonder envision that you have shanty town building up around European cities of migrant labors. And if you had no control of freedom of movement uh, in, in such an unevenly developed world, uh, wouldn't that be uh, problematic? Because, yes, you could say they would kind of sit there peacefully and work, but that becomes to some extent unlikely. You wouldn't want to have to anticipate unrest, riots, um, um, demands. So, so, so uh, I know that in the pure system logic, one could let migration across everywhere. If, and presumes that everybody is believing in a, a non-aggression principle. But in anticipation that this might be unrealistic, if difference of uh, wealth and standards of living become very, very proximate with groups with different cultures and languages coming into direct proximity, allowing that to kind of build up. I just, just it's a puzzle, I don't have a, 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 a an answer to this, I'm throwing that in as a question. Uh, how are you mediating an end game which we might all agree on? And what are we are we just saying we're not talking about geopolitics and nations and we're just talking about a future blueprint of of total freedom or are we uh, is a libertarian would a libertarian party <coughs> deliver statements and messages which 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 has a kind of series of interim step strategies which are addressed. Uh, well, I was actually talking about Norman Angel, particularly. <laughs> well, <laughs> but but, but I, I mean, I, I would just say, remember that if we are talking about a future libertarian order, then of course there aren't going to be uh, welfare states. Yeah. So, um, you know, that would be one point to make. So, uh, and when, when, people, when immigrants do come, remember, they, they uh, in order to get the jobs, which will get them to pay the full yeah. services, for the full services which they receive, you know, they're going to have to integrate into the whole society in some way or other. Um, uh, I mean, the, I, I don't, you know, this idea of you've got shanty towns or whatever, I mean, uh, why not just say council estates initially? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean and then the, the, the history of immigrants is that they do rise rather rapidly um, up the chain, uh, often more rapidly than the uh, indigenous inhabitants. Well, they have the holiday outlook, don't they? If you go on holiday, we're more adventurous. And the, if we're at home, we're well, less adventurous. I think that helped, that helped me, what you just said. But, but uh, yes, I uh, know, but chap there. Um, just a comment. In contrast to Roman Angel's environment where the movement of people was so restricted and you, it was easier to hate some person on, you know, so far away, the place you've never been, never visited. And in contrast in today's society, we've virtually met people of all colors, have friends of people of all ethnicities, whatever. But basically, in a, in a world where we travel so much, um, how do you think the argument against war can be shaped from our perspective? Basically, my question is, how do you think wars will be, can, how will nation states convince their people to go in, into war on their behalf? And what do you think us as evolved people groups, for example, travel, will, be, will react to that because the world is so different now than it was then? Well, don't forget that in the, uh uh, years prior to 1914, 
that was a period of massive uh, expansion of opportunity for travel, uh, expansion of um, uh, transport systems. So, uh, the, you know, they were, the people before 1914 were, were seeing new countries and there was um, you know, newspapers and all sorts of uh, mechanisms for getting to know people from other countries. Uh, but that didn't stop them from hating them, you know. And um, look, if you can get the British and American people to uh, back the um, Iraq war, which they did initially in quite large numbers, oh. And, you know, the, a piddling little country like Iraq was uh, a big danger to them. Uh, you, can, you can do anything, you know, I think, really. And um, I, I don't think this, um, the fact that you've traveled and you've met people from other countries really affects it. But, um, you know, once the propaganda machine gets going, um, you know, you, you can... Uh, you can fool some of the some of the people. What is it? You can fool all of the people some of the Lincoln. time. Lincoln. Some of the people all of the time. And, and I think in the case of getting the war going, you know, you are fooling uh, all the people some of the time. This is what happened with Iraq, and that, that, then of course you you can't do it all the time. But you oh you don't have to do it all the time. You just do it some of the time. John and then Pat. Uh, given that he was so popular at the time. And seem to have so little influence. Um, I mean, was Norman Angel uh, a failure, complete failure? I mean, he happened to be right in what he said, but in terms of his influence, it, uh, he, he might as well not have written the book. Well, he was very influential in the sense that uh, he, he, uh, loads of people bought his book. Um, and uh, he, he knew some important people, and um, he got the Nobel Peace Prize. The only person to deserve it. In, in 1930s. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right. um, and, and he also was living at the time of the two greatest uh, slaughterhouses of uh, human history, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, what, 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 what can you say about that? You, what, what, you, what you, I suggest is that... Um, yeah, that uh, just writing books and um, being right is um, is not good enough. So what is? He didn't fail to give advice. We failed to take advice. Yeah, I think it is good enough, but there's something more needed. You, know, uh, you you've got to change people's minds, and you've got to change the institutions. You know, I mean, the problem of war is that there is something that can pay for war, can afford war namely taxation. So you could say that taxation is the cause of war. Uh, the reason why free trade tries out war is because ordinary firms do not have, uh, under ordinary conditions, unless they're the East India Company, oddly got the ability to tax. Uh, but the East India Company aside, ordinary firms don't have the ability to tax. So war is based upon taxation, and taxation is based upon political authority. Abolish the political authority, you got rid of the war. David? Oh, so, sorry, it was Pat and then David. Okay, yes, yeah, just to pick up on what the gentleman over here was saying. I mean, sometimes you, there is a, there's a great moral cause for war, a great moral case for war anyway. Um, I mean, I disagree with what Bob said about open borders and everyone's going to live happily ever after, you know, in this fairy tale world of, of, of liberty and then everybody in a happy body. I mean, you might have people from another country who want to come along, force their way in, so you have to stop them coming with castles or whatever, um, like they did in medieval times. I mean, some people don't want to integrate and they don't want to get involved in crime. They just want to maybe kill and occupy the land, as the Anglo-Saxons did against the Celts, or the, the Romans did against the Celts, or you know, the Vikings did against other people. Um, the, you still get that situation today. And you get, uh, you get religious wars, civil wars, for example, that happened in, America, in, in the USA. In fact, generally speaking, just on a general scale, war has never been a problem, really. Not with the ordinary individual, the ordinary people. War has never been a problem. 
problems be murder and, and his neighbor, uh, the, the neighbors killing each other and that kind of thing. Even, even the Great War, which is the worst I can think of. No, probably the American Civil War was greater than that, as far as statistics is concerned. And that was a civil war, not a national war. Um, if you look at the Great War, I mean, even the huge numbers there, weren't that such a big impact on, 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 on the national statistics? I mean, the, the flu that followed killed more people than the actual war did. But war isn't that much of a problem, actually. The, 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 the problem with, with people dying and being killed are from their, uh, uh, you know, being murdered, industrial accidents, that kind of thing. Um, but you also have a case where there is, you, you can assume that if you don't do anything, you don't have a war, if you don't, if you don't try and protect your borders and mountains, everyone, everyone thinks going to be hunkery-dory and people are just going to come in and assimilate and everyone's going to live happily ever after. It doesn't happen. Some communities simply want to take over um, and they want to exterminate, rather like the Doctor Who and the Daleks. <laughs> And you know, you, evil does exist, unfortunately. And uh, so, so is that uh, living in a naive world? Yes, there's enough question, but there's enough, Steve. Well, well, I'll answer it. I'll just make a number of points. One is, yeah, I think war is a problem, actually. And um, it is now with the nuclear uh, age. I must uh, just let, 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 age. let, let and me. Um, the, uh, no, I think it was a problem. Age. It was a problem before the nuclear age. And, uh, it's not just. That, that the first, say the First World War, which is, uh, you know, the one that Angel was trying to avoid, is um, ki killing millions of people, and it may not have killed as many as the uh, um, Spanish flu out, uh, outbreak, but okay, uh, you know, it still killed a lot, and um, it also also affected uh, the development of the world in the rest of the 20th century, so. Uh, you know, you, you, without the First World War, I'm just, you wouldn't have ever had a Bolshevik Revolution, so you wouldn't have had the whole uh, Cold War business between the West and Russia. You know, Russia would have developed on um, uh, maybe constitutional lines, um, and uh, you wouldn't have had probably the uh, rise of National Socialism in uh, Germany. So you wouldn't have had the whole um, business um, of the Second World War or the whole uh, uh, threats of the 1930s. Well, that's um, because there was an amnesty. Just a minute. I'm going to be past. Um, on this Anglo-Saxons and Celts business, um, well, yes, I mean, Angel doesn't talk much with that, but it, well, he's making the point that we're talking about war in the modern age with modern developed economies. And he, you know, uh, he doesn't say that you couldn't um, gain in the Anglo-Saxon and Celts days. He's just saying that in the modern economies where countries are in interdependent and credit and um, trade exists, that um, in those circumstances you lose. And uh, finally, on the Civil War question, well, uh, you know, my view on the civil, civil wars, and Angel doesn't really talk about them, but is, yes, you have civil wars, yes. Uh, I'm sure that uh, orders within nations break down. But the best thing is to just stay out of those. You know, the best thing that um, people could do with Syria now is just stay out of it. And um, it, it, will, it will finish more quickly that way. I mean, think of the case of uh, Northern Ireland, where you had a sort of quasi-civil war there, really. And would things have been improved by the uh, great powers intervening there, dropping bombs on different uh, areas of Northern Ireland, or um, sending their own troops in to fight, or special forces? I mean, you, Belfast would have looked like Aleppo. And uh, would that have uh, um, made the uh, casualty rate bigger or smaller in Northern Ireland? And would it have made a, a solution easier or harder? I mean, it's I think difficult to say over the long run. And, and of course, the big thing that 1914 really did is it stopped the spread of international capital evening the world up. You wouldn't have the third world if it wasn't for 1914. And, you wouldn't, and then you wouldn't have the problem that everyone's moaning about now of mass immigration 
because the capital would have gone to the workers rather than the workers coming to the capital. But anyway, David? Yeah, my view for what it's worth is that the, it's that the, 19, it's that the 1914 outbreak of war was the greatest disaster that's ever struck mankind. And I, I was just going to take up one point which you made, David, uh, a few moments ago, which I would consider wrong, actually. I would, you said that taxation is the cause of war, but actually most wars tend to be funded by money printing and the destruction mm. of money. And actually, there'd probably be fewer wars if states did actually fund their wars out of taxation rather than borrowing the money printing. That's not an argument for taxation at all. <laughs> oh, but the but inflation is a form of taxation. Well, yes. Okay. That's what saying. But the, but no. it's the authority that my, states have to tax. My point is that if states, as it were, honestly funded wars out of current taxation, you'd probably get fewer wars, actually. Uh, if you think Over up front, yeah. If well, I think you, you you might get the wars, but the wars would end more quickly shorter. because they'd run out of money. Well, they'd see the cost but, of the um, wars more clearly. Yeah. Uh, the public wouldn't put up. Given, given the... Um, <laughs> Loss of face that all that involves, you know, you can be sure they're going to print, and they, that's what they've done. It's secret taxation, yeah. yeah. But it's the authority to tax, that's my point. The firms don't have that. Oh, well. uh, therefore, all that goes free trade trades out for. Just, uh, Are we done? Is there any more? The oh, well, let's uh, continue this uh, as we wish uh, over a drink in the bar. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here.